Happy Tuesday evening, Bills Mafia and football fans alike. My name is Joe DeRosa. You can find me on Twitter at show underscore DeRosa. And I don't know if you heard the news. You probably heard the news. Stefan Diggs is no longer a Buffalo Bill. We've all had our time to kind of process the information overload we got last week. And here we are about a week later to discuss the aftermath of that trade, what the Bills offense could potentially look like, and ways it could still improve despite the loss. And joining me tonight is one of the good friends of the show, Luca of Bills Chat, as the two of us will be going over all of that and more right here on this week's episode of Under Review. Thank you all for your patience as I navigated through some tech issues, not number twos. With that being said, let's go. Previous play will go under review. And once again, everybody, happy Tuesday. Thank you so much for being here. Comment section, we started 10 minutes late tonight, and you are already rolling. I want to give a special shout-out to Buff Everett for this absolutely incredible comment. If tech issues is your way of quote-unquote covering up, no pun intended, the fact that you had to two, I will wait. No, I did not. Tech issues happen to all of us, but I am absolutely loving these contributions. So friends, Thank you so much for being here tonight. If you could be kind enough to drop a like on this video. I know the tardiness isn't always looked on well, but we're here. We're ready to talk. And joining me tonight, as always, is Luca. Well, not as always. He's here every now and then. But he's been here before. Luca, thank you so much for being here, man. How are you doing tonight? No, appreciate it. Yeah, when you shout it out, I know you've reached out in the past. And unfortunately, our timelines didn't work out. But I was happy that this time we were able to make something work. I was really excited about it. And uh, I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to have you here, man. We always have some great conversations. You and Josh do a great job over on your show, and I'm really happy to see you know all the success that you guys have had, especially with the big move. So appreciate your time. And I like this comment from Roy because it's a great way to kick this thing off. For the love of all that is holy, I hope, like hell, this is the last podcast I have to keep hearing about the Stefan Diggs trade. Roy, yes. And the reason we're talking about it is because to move forward, we must look to the past for strength as we navigate through these turbulent times. And Luca, as I stated when we opened the show, and as you've seen a million times over, the Bills traded Stefan Diggs. It is no surprise anymore for a second round pick in 2025. Before we begin our conversation going deeper into some of the new things we could see offensively, some of the roads we could take, just talk to me about your initial reaction to seeing the news and how you've processed it nearly a week later. I mean, it's big news. When it first happened, it's big news, right? And all of that stuff. And as time has progressed, it, it feels like a move that truly felt like a the inevitable uh, finality of that kind of relationship that was Diggs with the Bills, with Allen, with whatever else was going on. Obviously, there's probably things that will still trickle through um, that we learn of over time. I imagine whenever that uh, Bills at Texans matchup comes upcoming this upcoming season, we're probably going to hear a few more things come through the grapevines, you know, whether it's in the national scope, the local scope, whatever it might be. But um, overall, the move makes sense, I think, for both fronts. Right. And at the end of the day, that's what matters, regardless on how you feel about the return and what you had to add in order to get that return. I think it's a necessary move at this point in time. If things were truly at the point that they were and, and overall, it just, regardless on how you feel about the play on the field and what was needed at the receiver position, there are certain things that clearly Bean and others just felt were more prioritized in this move. And that is is what it is. You know, he could probably do great for the Texans in this one year that he's going to be there. And, you know, maybe yeah. more depending on what goes on. But overall, the Bills just wanted life after digs and they took what they could get. And speaking purely from a football standpoint, not even going into the behind the scenes of it, Stefan Diggs is coming off, at least as a bill, one of his worst seasons. And I have defended Diggs a million times over. You can all quote me on anything I've said on the show in the past. And I still truly subscribe to the idea that Diggs was not 100%, that Diggs was still getting open, and that Diggs was a huge benefit to the rest of your room. So I think in that regard, when he goes to Houston, I think he's going to have success, even if he isn't as the you know, permanent one target because you do have Nico Collins and Tank Dell. But 
I was never one to subscribe to the narratives. I was never one to be in this position of Diggs is this, Diggs is that. Oh, we heard a rumor. Oh, here we go. He's getting traded. I never did. And I stand on saying that I defended it in the past. I never thought it was going to happen until it did. And what that indicated to me from beyond just Diggs being 31 years old and Diggs' production falling off and the team seeming to find a way to still maneuver and be productive despite not having him be that guy anymore is that whatever was going on brewing underneath the surface just was simply too much. And the team felt that even though it would put them in a bad situation as far as taking a $31 million dead cap to the chin this year for him to play for another team, they wanted to move on. They wanted to part ways, let him walk and, you know, do your thing somewhere else, but we're done with you here. And I will stand on saying that Stefan Diggs is one of my all-time favorite bills for what he did for this team after the drought era. I mean, what they did post-2019 with him, even if they didn't get the ultimate goal accomplished, he will always go down in good graces with me, and I will appreciate his time here. And I have no ill will as much as I think. He clearly, just based on what we kept hearing, wasn't at the same level of comfort he once was, and the team decided it was better to move on. So, Steph Diggs, enjoy your time in Houston and eventually Dallas. Let's let's rip that bandaid off right now, Luca. He's going to be a freaking cowboy. Like it's the most, It is the most obvious thing in the world. And like, if it doesn't happen, I will, I, I will eat crow here on camera, but he's going to be a freaking cowboy. He's going to go play with Trey. But any other thoughts on this before we carry on to kind of just viewing the team's current structure and life after? Yeah, no, the current structure, it quite simply is going to be a big conversation of this episode. I know for sure after sending the outline, and I think it opens up a lot of discussion that we're all going to have, uh, you know, in the, in the space of being Bills fans, but Life after digs is something that truly just felt necessary, but overall it shouldn't necessarily tarnish the image on our, our previous show that released on Monday. Josh asked the question, you know, is he going to be a wall of famer? Is he going to be a legend of the game? Things of that nature. And it's like, wall of fame's not going to happen, but overall time heals all. And he will of course be welcomed back, you know, in this area as a legend of the game and stuff. We've seen the likes of like a Marshawn Lynch who also right. kind of wanted his way out, but he's still beloved in this community and everything like that. And among the fan base. So overall I can absolutely see a world in five, seven, eight years where you have a digs coming back with the new stadium and whatnot, and they bring him back and things are well, I, I don't see how this is going to truly create. I mean, there are going to be some that spite him and, and, you know, some that feel hard done, but there's, there's people like that in all facets. And overall, I think the general consensus is things will be okay in time. And, and it's just one of those things where I think lines started to get blurred on uh, personal emotions with professionalism and, and overall, like you even said, being looked at at a strictly business level deal where it's like your production seems to be dripping uh, or dropping and we can't afford dripping. We can't <laughs> afford to essentially pay you. We, we don't even want to risk dealing with what we're going to have to deal with in order to see what you can do at the cost, what it is. So let's take another 3 million on the chin this year and send you off and then manage everything else as much as we can. So it, it, it is what it is. We're going to have to move on life without it. And, and I think the bills, as long as they have 17, of course, they'll be okay. Yeah. It's just going to be fascinating more so now as we lead into the draft, as we go into the, the depths of off season before we get into training camp that, I'm very, very fascinated among everyone else on how they will handle the receiver position in specific fashion. Yes, at uh, one thousand percent. I mean, that's the glaring need now. And lastly, on digs, I'll just say this. I mean, the one thing that I can stomach a week later that I was honestly so stricken by when it first happened was how the hell did we afford to do this? Because I'll anyone who's watching this show watches our other content has seen Greg talk about it numerous times about how they are literally would have to pay for him to play elsewhere. They would literally like, if he said he didn't want to play for the bills, they have to give him that money. Well, now they have to give him that money to go play for another team. And it's hard to hear that and hard to process that when you first learn it. And I still think that it's, it's a shitty situation to be in like full transparency, because why in the world would you ever want your previous alpha to go be elsewhere? But what I will say is the fact that the Band-Aid's essentially ripped off now, and what you're seeing is just an additional three mil to your chin. You get 10 and a half back from the Trey White deal. And then you're talking about after the season, no more. The books are clear. He's gone. It's done. We can move on in a way that's much more healthy, much more cat friendly for the future. I think with that in mind, a few days later, I'm able to kind of 
nod my head and say, okay, this is a little bit better. I, I obviously would prefer to keep him, but I can at least rationalize that he's gone. And also, seeing Houston basically cave to make him play there for a season makes it a lot more palatable as well because it's not like he got fleeced and he's going to run the table there for four seasons. I mean, unless he has a stellar year and they decide to bring him back. But I just think that the fact that you rip that cat bandit off and now you can just move on and plan your future out without him. No, he's gone, which obviously it sucks, but you could build the room holistically younger. It's a little bit of a better deal for me, a little pe- a better of a pill to swallow. So Luca now Diggs is gone. The receiver room is um, interesting with the way it's currently constructed because excluding tight ends, I mean, you could include Kincaid and Knox, obviously pass catchers. You got Curtis Samuel, you have Khalil Shakir, you have everyone's favorite receiver, Justin Shorter. You have Terrell Shavers and Mac Collins so, and KJ Hamler. So let's just talk about the room's construction right now. And I just want to ask you, what is like a way, I guess if you want to call it a path, for the Bills to instantly improve. And obviously we could say draft or free agency, but like as far as the types of receivers you'd like to see added to the current construction of the room, what is your preference as far as what you'd like to see the Bills do there? I The one thing that really kind of um, glares its uh, ugly head when it comes to this receiver room is you joke about tongue in cheek with Justin Shorter, right? And Tyrell Shavers and these guys. It's like, look, they could be something potentially but you can't bank on them being anything. There's a reason they were drafted in the positions they were or brought in in the positions they were, and there's a reason we haven't really seen them in an offensive capacity at all yet. Um, with that in mind, the, realistically, you're looking at you know your, your Curtis Samuel, your Khalil Shakir, and then your, as you even mentioned, if you want to bring in pass catching in general, you have your Kincaid, your Knox, and then even James Cook. The one thing that lacks there is just kind of truly that that kind of go get it ball kind of guy, that mm. that guy where you really understand that in a pinch when, when Allen's trying to create, when he's trying to do what he does and loves it's I, I'm not expecting Curtis Samuel to go up and fight for a ball. I'm not saying that he can't do it. It's just, that's not what you're asking him to do. Khalil Shakir can do it as well, but that's not what you're asking him to do. It's not where he's at his best. And, and, and really, yes, Justin shorter has the size and potential maybe, but overall, again, I'm not going to rely on that. We're not going to go, Hey, we're putting Justin Shorter in these roles and you, you bring in a Mac Hollins and stuff like that too. And it's okay. You're trying to figure something out at a cost friendly solution, but right. overall you just want to see some, we'll, we'll call it youthful legs in that spot. And that's where the draft obviously just is so glaring in front of you. It's like, you have to spend a blue chip there. It seems like on a pass catcher that really kind of fills that void on top of then potentially can develop into another true one because yes, by community, you know, by, by, uh, by committee, you can get everything going, but you really need that kind of that go-to guy and Kincaid honestly can potentially be that. Yeah. That's not a conventional route. And at the end of the day, I'm not, I'm still not even in this year or even maybe even into next year going to ask him to be that guy. So can mm-hmm. we draft someone else who also could develop into that? Because then you don't need to rely on Kincaid in year three, year four to do that. And now also you have someone else developing like, you know, of course, we'll discuss it like get Brian Thomas Jr., whatever route right. you want to go with that. That is someone else that's in-house on a controlled salary as well that then you can just see what you got and really try to develop something special in this now true turn page next generation. Because as we go into next year, then if you're not liking where the development is, as you even brought up cap space opens up, you can get really creative with what's out there. And there are potential potential targets that could be had in the future that you, you kind of play a risky game this year. You can still be competitive, but evaluate what you have in house and then really kind of be aggressive once again in the future. So I like a point that you brought up in the midst of that, where you talked about the by committee and filtering to one guy, because I think that's going to be a divisive talking point amongst Bills fans as we get closer to the draft and even post draft about the construction of the room and how you prefer to build it. And, you know, I do. I ha- I'm one of those annoying people who never commits to one total thing. You guys know I like to keep it open ended. So there's a lot of pads I could see the bill take bills taking one of those pads being they could do the trade up. They could go get the alpha in the draft potentially go get a neighbor's Odunze, whoever it has to be Joe Dunze. And you would see them have that, that alpha that bat. Well, neighbors isn't 
you know, he's he's about six feet. He's not a true boundary body, but he's just really freaking good and a really good separator. So it doesn't matter. And Odunze being a bit more of that conventional boundary body, but he's just also an elite separator with good speed and great hands and high points. Well, those are the one of the routes I could see them taking. But I'm kind of in the mindset of seeing how some teams around the league have constructed themselves, seeing some of our opposition have constructed themselves and then seeing how our offensive coordinator had it constructed when he was had at his last gig in 2020 with Carolina. What I have kind of felt would be a possibility if you had to ask me what I think the most likely possibility is, and I'm stressing what I think most likely, not that I think it's the full will happen thing because I could very well see them trading up too. But I do believe that this team has an opportunity to kind of take a route similar to what Green Bay took, where they really did hammer multiple assets into quality draft picks towards their offensive room. Now, granted, two of those picks for Green Bay had to be tight ends. You don't have to do that if you're Buffalo. But maybe instead of selling the farm or selling next year's first and selling the second to go all the way up to get that guy, as awesome as it would be, and I would absolutely talk myself into it, please do not take this as I don't want to do it. As much as I am trying to stress that there are multiple paths to success, I think that there is a world where this Bills team decides that with Joe Brady's past of having guys like Curtis Samuel, Chosen Anderson, uh, DJ Moore, all accumulating a thousand yards in their offense, now being an opportunity to add more to that room and an offense that you saw, Luca, in the second half of this year, being more fluid and spreading the ball around a bit more. It would not shock me if the Bills' path to that was let's just add bodies, bodies that we feel have a varying degree of skill sets, whether that's trading down to go get Lad McConkey in the 30s and having another separator and shifty guy, but going and getting a boundary body later or vice versa, where you maybe go for like an AD Mitchell and then go get yourself like, I don't know, a Jalen Polk or maybe like a Javon Baker or someone later on. I think that when you look at it that way, I can see the potential, how I would like to do it. If you are asking me, honestly, right now, my preferred path, preferred, not meaning I wouldn't do the other, but just what I'd rather go for. I think it's that because I think when you talk about a Bills team that needs sustainability, a foundation of young talent, talking about cheap production for the next few years, I feel like you are putting yourself in a much better position by allocating more assets to receiver, but still holding on to what you have next year and just allowing yourself to pick in the top 50, top 75 this year and next year so that the transition period isn't as a big of a blow because you are accumulating so much, at least if you can develop it, better talent. So that's just how I view it. But Luca, do you agree, disagree? Any other thoughts on that topic? The thought of the Green Bay structure, as we'll call it, is a fascinating one. It's a great discussion, to be quite honest, because what it truly was and what it is, is them just trying to, as you even pointed out, they, they're just throwing resources at a pass catching kind of need. And they went and they even got Christian Watson early second, so on mm. and so forth. And they they really just tried to throw as much as they could at the wall and see what stuck. What's fortunate for them is. It seems to be working out really well because they right. kept hitting on all of those different picks. Not everyone hits on those picks. Not mm -hmm. saying that the Bills aren't fully capable of doing that. Where I can talk myself into the trading back conversation is it's actually something that's outside of the receiver room. It includes the receiver room in this discussion, but it even goes beyond it. And, and what it is, is the Bills really need to refill the cupboard now. And mm. you can't be really selling the house when you look down the road and you really look to see what the depth at in a lot of defensive positions as well as other places, you're going to have to get those cost friendly guys in there and hopefully develop and hopefully let them live in whatever role it is, whether it's still being a depth player and maybe potentially stepping up in the safety positions, whatever it is that they can do. Again, we mentioned the cap space early on, but overall, you can't rely on just buying whoever you want. And it's mm -hmm. going to fit. And when you pay in free agency, of course, you also pay a premium. So $60 million can go away very, very quickly. But it, it's it's one of those ones where if you sell the house to move up, I, for what it's worth, I still love going and getting a true dog. Like mm -hmm. if, in a year where there are plenty of them and, and it feels like it, you would normally have to go up in the top eight to get that true dog. This year, you might be able to get it potentially on how the board works at a later point. But overall, it is very understandable. It's like, hey, trade back. Make sure you don't sell the house. There are plenty of depth options as we're talking about early second, even into the third, bleeding into day three and into the fourth round. 
that it's like, these are guys that are day two. If you're talking fourth round guys, any other year, it feels like these guys would trickle into that day two category. But yeah. just because there's so many of them, naturally you have the trickle down effect and they're going to fall. It's just the nature mm -hmm. of the beast. So it's a fascinating discussion that I think realistically going, even tying it to the digs trade. I don't think the digs trade happens unless Bean already had an understanding of what was in front of him, evaluating the board, evaluating what else is out there in the market, things of that nature, even maybe making some phone calls on potential. I'm not saying they're trading, but I'm just saying he did his due diligence and made sure he understood every available option out there beyond a world of digs and made the, made the educated decision. Hey, we can afford to do it now. We'll eat it, take our medicine, and we're going to attack it by X, Y, and Z. And the draft is obviously a clear route where now it's going to be fascinating if they move up, move back, stay where they are. The least likely scenario in my eyes is staying at 28. It's mm. something that Bean has basically never done. The only two <laughs> picks he's ever done is nine for Ed Oliver and 30 for Gregory Rousseau. That is it. And he's moved up almost every other time. I believe he's moved up every time otherwise. So it's where trading back... It's funny. It's like I can absolutely agree with, hey, we should move back, get your A.D. Mitchell, even if you can get in the top five of the second round and he falls, mm -hmm. whatever it is. But the thing in the back of my head is like Bean always likes to move up. He yeah. sees his first round great guys. And all of a sudden, one of them's trickling down to the 20s and he's like, screw it. We're pulling the trigger. We're getting this guy. And, and, and in my eyes, I like that aggressive attitude. But overall... It is a fascinating discussion because you have the cupboard that needs to be restocked a little bit. You can't truly sell the house to maybe go get an Adunze, although I have no problem with an Adunze. Right. But at the end of the day, it, it's really kind of managing all of your resources and seeing where you go from there. And and I still think there is a legitimate path where you could actually execute that trade up to go to, let's call it number nine, right? Let's say the Bears want to trade out and Odunze is, is on the board. I think if that is actually how it plays out, that is a very, you got to keep your eyes on it because I genuinely think Bean would make an attempt to get up there mm -hmm. because I think that the bears would get capital and you would still be giving up a haul. Like at minimum, you're probably next year's first, next year's second, this year's first, but you'd still have your second round pick for next year too. And then for this year, you might be able to accumulate something in that deal where you still don't have to mortgage the entirety of your draft. It could still add young talent. So trading up doesn't, particularly mean it's going to be bare and there's going to be no ability to add depth in this draft. But I think with the way things sit right now, it feels like to me, when you're talking about how people perceive this receiver class and you look at the big three, which we've called them the big three since it started, and we all know their talent and what they could be in the NFL. But the fact that it's still referred to as such a deep receiver class, it almost feels like the pressure to do it this year isn't the same as what it would have been maybe in years past where you had a really elite mountaintop and then the rest just falls off very quickly. And why I bring up Green Bay and why I come back to it all the time is because that to me is an offense that has just a very balanced way of spreading things out, a very modern offense, an offense that caters to Jordan Love's skill set very well with a lot of play action, a lot of under center, a lot of misdirection, and a lot of really capable shifty receivers that they rebuilt from the ashes of the Devontae Adams trade. I feel like that just to me feels like the most sustainable model because it's not so dependent on one guy. Now, I'm not saying that you can't lean on someone a little bit more like Dalton Kincaid because I've said on this show, I think he's your second option. Now I think he's your first option because Diggs is freaking gone. So that just changed that whole conversation. But you don't need to be centric on one guy. And I think this, I, I call back to the second half of last year with Joe Brady and a really interesting point that I didn't really believe in time, but I think actually makes a lot of sense looking back on it. And I'm, I'm blanking on the name of the reporter. So please tell me in the comments who it is, but he stated that the bills effort in the second half of last year was an attempt to prove that we don't need digs. I didn't think that at the time. And even then I still think like, okay, I don't think they were saying like, we don't need you Steph. We're going to do it without you. Cause Diggs still had a role. Diggs was still window dressing essentially to get other people open and kind of pulling the strings back to make things appear in the middle of the field. But what I will say is 
I think Joe Brady's offense is just catered to being a committee style where you're talking about West Coast, you're talking about tempo, you're talking about a variety of different targets with different skill sets that, hey, on any given play, we can punch you in the mouth. On any situation, whether you have a poor run defense, whether your secondary is trash, we have an answer for it every time. When I saw him shove James Cook down Dallas's throat last year, that just told me that this man is not afraid to stick to one thing if it's working and pivot when he needs to even in the playoff game against Kansas City it was kind of similar until they had to get off of it because Kansas City made an adjustment and loaded their box up I think that that's a very realistic path that this team could take but if they did decide to go for an alpha I will not be mad at it I will understand it please don't get mad at me because I am suggesting that maybe staying put or trading down is something that the Bills could potentially do and Luca. I ran a poll on Twitter. I don't know if you saw it, but I wanted to read the results here tonight. So I'm going to share my screen. Now, I'm warning you all, when I share my screen, things glitch out. So this could be where the tech issues <laughs> resurface. Let's see what happens. I click share. Luca, can you see my screen? I sure can. Oh, that's great. Can I see this screen? Oh, my goodness, I can. That's, th well, two shows in a row, not two weeks in a row. That it actually worked. What a concept. All right, everybody. Here is the the poll if you did not vote it is okay i will forgive you just this one time but if you did vote thank you for your vote i know it was a lot of effort and hardship for you to click a button on your screen but i appreciate your effort it is never lost on me and i will reread it because the screen is small all right hashtag bills fans it is time to feel the pulse which of the below options would you prefer the bills to do this off season? And I gave you the choices of trade for plus extend a wide receiver that got you to 22.3% trade up in the draft. The victor of this poll, 57.7% and stay put at 28, 19.9%. The fans would love to trade up for an alpha. And I have said it on Twitter that I have warmed up for the idea. I am not opposed to it. I have seen people like Mark Henry here say trade up for Thomas Jr. I have seen trade up for BTJ twice, actually. I would give draft picks in a trade by Mike. I don't know Mike's last name. Sorry, Mike. Then we got Taylor to George with trade back and a variety of different options here. So first and foremost, again, thank you, everybody, for voting on this. Way to make us feel bad for not knowing about the poll. I'm only joking, Drew. You're okay. It's not an actual serious thing. It's only if you wanted to vote. But, Luca, the fans say that they want to trade up. Do you, I mean, again, we just talked about it, but how do you feel about the sentiment in general? Because it felt like it really just wasn't a realistic thing. And now all of a sudden it's like, holy shit, they could actually do this. Like, the fun part about trading up, and this is where I get with trading up and just from the outsider's perspective, and I'm, I'm a sucker for this as well. This is not like I'm saying only others. It's the prospect of the ceiling, right? It's the prospect of the unknown. And you look at these guys coming into a draft and you're like, this guy can be this. It's the comp season, right? This, Malik Neighbors is this. Roma Dunze is this. This is what they can be. It's like that when you talk about, you know, comparisons and all of that stuff, it's obviously discussing their ceiling. It's not something you're going to most likely get in year one. Although receivers are coming in more and more pro ready. And I think that also goes into the whole conversation with why are they flipping the page on the digs era this early? Well, early is in quotation marks, but overall, why are they doing this? And I do think Bean is trying to stay ahead of the curve, be like the Packers who are trying to also do this where you just, draft as much as you possibly can throw it at the wall see what sticks and at on top of it you're trying not to pay the premium dollar for these premium guys as much as possible then you go back to it and as a fan you're like now let's go trade up for the the premium receiver that we can now get so that we have four or five years of him on a controlled salary and then we'll let the money be the problem down the road when hopefully the nfl is worth 10 billion dollars and right. the cap is you know ridiculous and the the metrics move and all that fun stuff but Overall, I, I found it fascinating. I, I will say it's weird that I'm tying this in here, but uh, someone, I don't remember who it was in the national media. It wasn't a bum. I will say that because I don't really <laughs> listen to those bum national media people. But overall, one of them were like, it feels slowly after the digs trade where you're having a GM and the Green Bay was also brought up in this discussion where it's you're noticing some of these teams kind of strategically almost operate at receiver after all the contracts came where they're like, is this about to become the next running back and not in the way where they devalue them too much, but because they come in so pro ready, you're going to try to do your absolute best not to pay them 
And yeah. then eventually, if you have a Justin Jefferson or whatever it is, you can't let that guy out of house because Justin Jefferson, of course, is the best receiver in the league and has been for years. So you you cannot afford to let that guy leave because no one will truly be better than that. But overall, it's one of those things where now you start to see a diminishing kind of return. And it's like, OK, move on before you get too deep into it get some more things in and that's where the elite receiver comes in. And I absolutely understand why fans want to trade up and get that guy because you just want that dog. And I, I love that mentality, but I will say I am actually, and I voted for it. Josh, uh, they, I will say Joe, sorry, Josh used to have it. I am now Joe um, McCarty, everybody. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Joe, <laughs> I voted for trade and extend only because Ooh. I am the kind of individual where it's, at the end of the day, I don't think you trade for anyone, even if it's like a Brandon Ayuk. You're not sending pick 28 for that. I don't believe it's it's a situation where money's involved and you can probably strong arm them to a point where you don't have to give up pick 28. And if that's the case, then you go and you pull that trigger, you extend, you do that and see what you can do from there, because now you bring in a proven commodity that you can still have for years on moving forward and still mess around in the draft, take your later round receivers, do whatever it is you got to do. And you can still kind of live in this world and philosophy where money in the future years doesn't matter anymore, as we've also discussed. So that's kind of where I side on it. I, I love that you voted for that option, because to be honest, I, I didn't know how much people were going to cave to that, because I know that Higgins and Ayuk are options that people float around all the time. And there is a world where it could happen, like especially with Ayuk or someone that you could extend down the road, because if you're talking about Diggs is dead cap to your chin this year, but then he's off the books for next year, then it's almost like you're just continuing that payment of a premium receiver which they know how to do and work around. But I still think in that world, I think it's the least likely option only because, again, I don't think when you're talking about the point you made earlier about, well, they don't really like, I, I'm paraphrasing, but basically like trying not to pay the receiver unless they're good enough to be that level. I think with a rookie, it's like, well, yes, we do have to develop them. However, if we can get like four or five years out of you before we got to do it or three years out of you before we got to do it, I think a GM is going to try and take that approach. And I think like Green Bay right now, I will throw that. I'm going to reference them as many times on the show because I just love what they're building over there. I think that model in a post Rogers world is so awesome to see because people like just genuinely wrote them off like, all right, he's gone. They're done. And then Jordan Love rose from the ashes like a phoenix and Jaden reed who i stand on the show last year with bruce bruce nolan and i'm very sad he's gone and at green bay but you know happy for them you know it's just one of those things where i think i i could see it but i just don't think it's as likely as it being something yeah. where they just go holistic but i also <laughs> eric ward with this comment i'm not sure what you're referencing eric so please, in the comments below, just tell me, but why are the Air Raid Hour boys so surely? This is a great comment out of context because I have no idea what he's referring to. So please tell me because I will throw it back up on the screen. But it's just funny to be like, man, Judge and Tilt are just so surely and just no more. Nothing else yeah. to it. Just yeah. like you guys, I'm going to message them later. But like, you guys are just so surely. I love it. But everybody, <laughs> thank you for voting. I do apologize if uh, I see a few people in the comments here uh, are not on Twitter and I do realize that because not everyone's on Twitter, not everyone can vote. If you are a member of the one pass below, you would get an opportunity to be in our Slack channel where I could gauge your interest. If that is an easier way for you. I also know that uh, RJ here suggests carrier pigeon and carrier pigeon while a bit outdated is a bit effective. I mean, I don't know if anyone's watched Shogun recently, but that show they tend to use. I don't think it's pigeons, but they're using birds and it works pretty well. I mean, news is getting around. So carrier pigeon might be a suitable option as well. But in all seriousness, I apologize if you do not have Twitter. I will try to think of a more accessible approach for anyone that might not be on social media to get involved with these polls. But I do appreciate all of you voting. We're continuing the conversation. But before I do, I want to pull the one pass but instead of me just shouting at the screen more and more why don't i let our good friends greg thompson and aaron quinn tell you gentlemen what do you got many people ask us the best way to support us here at cover one and that is to sign up to become a cover one one pass member that contribution helps give us the access to all the data and information we use to create the content that you love and I think most importantly, brings you into our community of insiders. It's a great community based on Slack. I know a lot of people don't want to be on social media anymore, or be in on those conversations. We bring all of it to you right in our great community of educated fans. And most importantly, you get access to our content creators. Even better than that, everybody loves merch. You get awesome t-shirts, a cool decal, and a letter from the Cover One team signed directly to you. All for $60. That gets you the entire season, next year's free agency and draft. 60 bucks. Click the link in the description. Cover One Insider. Become one today. 
Yes, become one today for 60 gold doubloons. You can become a One Pass member. And as I say every single show, that One Pass is the lifeblood of Cover One that allows us to have access to all of the wonderful resources that we use to look up any sort of statistics, use any sort of film as any basis for any opinion we have, as well as so many other things. So if you are not a member, I strongly encourage you to sign up. There is a premium Slack channel with a lot of like-minded Bills fans talking about Bills stuff in life in general and it is a pleasure to be a part of so please check it out if you haven't already pre-recorded one pass ads for the win thank you drew <laughs> luca let's continue our conversation so we've talked a little bit about joe brady and the receivers by committee but i just want to ask you your opinions on him going into this year and kind of i guess if you want to call it what you could realistically see joe brady's offense looking like based on your perception of how this team could address this room in 2024. The Joe Brady discussion is one that I feel like I might zag where a lot of people zig in, in the sense of this, where it's, I understand. And I'm with uh, like, even your point where it's, Hey, he's proven that he does this by committee. He's, he's got a track record of doing these things. And this is why they're probably going down this road. I don't know if for certain that everything is being done with in mind that Joe Brady should be the one for years to go. I think he deserves to get the trial period that he is. And I'm calling it trial period on purpose because he needs to now show that he can develop his own playbook, develop his own thing, implement that with Josh Allen and everything else. And it will still succeed. What we saw last year, and it was kind of discussed at great lengths was he still had to take the resources he was already given and just on the staff of and just mm -hmm. operate it in his own flavorful way. Now it's all up to him. This is all him. This is his thing. And it feels like now at this point, it's not like McDermott's not on the hot seat. And overall he would be, he, he's got a track record. If you don't provide him results, he's going to cut your head before he gets his own head cut. And at the end of the day, I think Joe Brady needs to still show that what he can do with a full off season is truly going to provide this team with something great down the road. They're still going to draft in a way that will hopefully benefit him. But what I'm getting at is I don't think it's like he gets the end all say on this. I think this is going to be a bean driven thing. And McDermott as well is going to have, of course, a massive input on all of this stuff. But Joe Brady's offense, I will say, is most likely going to be very committal like and all of those things. It's just if the decision on trading up for a big guy or trading back to then get a bunch of some of parts, I don't think that's influenced by necessarily as much of Joe Brady as it is just being believing that this is what's best for the team three, four years down the road as much as it is now as well. Um, mm -hmm. It's one of those things where I separate those two kind of thoughts. I'm excited to see what Joe Brady can do because there is some great potential there. It's just kind of an unknown because this is really outside of Carolina where it was very short lived. This is kind of his first uh, off season to really show what he can do with a premium quarterback mm -hmm. in the NFL and what he can design on an offense and provide us. And I don't think we have truly enough of a track record to understand what that look will be, which in part could show some great returns early on in the season yes. since there's absolutely no film on it, but it will be fascinating to see what happens later on down the year when tape develops, when tendencies are obviously on film and all of a sudden, can he adjust? Can he do things that we didn't really see out of a Dorsey system and so on and so forth? So that is kind of where I will be under the microscope with Joe Brady um, this upcoming year. But I, I will say, and I'll finish it with a positive. I am excited for it. I'm excited yes. for something new. I'm excited for something different. And I'm very curious to see at what direction it goes right out the gate. Yes, I love the point you made earlier, just talking about his offense and talking about some of the different ways that, you know, at the second half last year, he didn't have really a playbook that was his. He was a part of it. I'm sure he implemented some things. I'm sure he contributed in some degree, but it wasn't his. It was Ken Dorsey's. And we saw that Ken Dorsey, while being able to construct it, just couldn't simply execute it in a way where you were giving things a bit more simplified or really working matchups, but rather just as Eric has pointed out, Ant has pointed out, so many people have pointed out, coverage beaters, things that you just throw out there because on paper they should work, but you're giving too many choice routes and too many things that create margins of error with every level that you end up stalling out or having miscommunications i'm putting this comment on the board because i like i like franzo's little uh like the idea i don't even want to call it a little idea because this is something that 
this is something I could actually see them doing more consistently. I think he's going to put Cook and Samuel in backfield to get them clean releases, use Kincaid in the big slot, and some packages with Shakir also in the slot as a third. I also apologize. Little idea sounds condescending. That's not what I meant, but and my stutter. Um, I love this idea because I think it's realistic, and I think that's something you are going to absolutely see from him because he got creative with Curtis Samuel back in Carolina. And that's the thing that I'm referencing when I look at what a Joe Brady offense could look like here in this year with Josh Allen. You got, again, I think I mentioned it before, but Chosen Anderson over a thousand yards, Curtis Samuel over a thousand all purpose yards because it was a combination of rushing and pass or receiving yards. And then DJ Moore over a thousand yards. I've seen a knock on Joe Brady where there was a tweet talked about how he's not good at scheming guys open. But what I think it is, isn't the fact that he can't scheme guys open I think it's just that the channel of emphasis in his offense is always going to go through the player that he wants on that given play it's not so much that we have the true one and therefore we have to force this to the true one every time if the one's getting open we'll get the ball to him sure but rather that if you are in his offense you are going to be more on your tool belt, more to do that might be assisting someone else in your room to get the ball in that given play. And while there are some that are better at it than others and guys that could get open more consistently, it is a possibility that the best receiver you have on your team might be someone who still is a cog in that machine to be a bit more versatile. And with Franzo's comment here, I think that's just one of the looks you could see. And one of the things that you could potentially see from his offense this year is a continued fleshed out playbook from Joe Brady, like you just pointed out, Luca, where now he gets to implement maybe more concepts that involve motion, maybe more free releases from the backfield, like Franzo just suggested, maybe more manipulation of the slot and guys that you could have run across the middle of the field and guys that you could work up the scene based on whatever you're seeing. But also, again, another lean on the running game and getting your run. Uh, your running backs with pass catching ability involved that could very well be viable. We haven't seen them sign a power back yet, by the way. We haven't seen them do anything besides Ty Johnson. There's a part of me that's almost thinking that they're just going to roll into the draft with that, get a rookie and see what he could do, but that they might like that combination because both of these guys are capable pass catchers that you can use in the screen game or all over the field. So for me, just based on what you were saying, based on that comment and really just all of these things, I think that Joe Brady's offense has a potential to, and again, another great point you made, Luca, the first half of the year, be hot right out of the gate because even though it is technically his first full year as OC, there isn't a true testament of tape because there are going to be new things conceptually that he is able to work on with a full offseason under his belt that you could see the Bills realistically have a lot of success even against good defenses because there's just a bag of tricks there. And then if you are implementing, and I'll tie this back to kind of my point point I made previous, a group of wide receivers, a committee of wide receivers with some talent, whether that's pick 28 and you decide to take A.D. Mitchell, trade down and you go get Ladd McConkey. maybe Brian Thomas Jr. falls into your lap. And then you complement that with who you've gotten in free agency, the receivers on your roster, and maybe another draft pick. You have a variety of ways that this offense could potentially beat you. And I think based on everything I've said in this episode so far, that is the most exciting prospect of Joe Brady's offense to me, is seeing the versatility and seeing, again, I'll, I'll pull it back to what I said in the beginning of the show about some of the teams that have bested them, right? The spread of weapons that they've had, the opportunity to be able to beat you. I know Cincinnati has Jamar Chase, who's their true one, but let's be realistic. There were three great receivers on that team and a quality tight end, at least in that year with Hayden Hurst when they beat us in the playoffs, that they were able to get the ball around to efficiently and effectively. I think this is your opportunity to fit that mold, fit the mold that the Chiefs have thrown at you. Because a great point made in our comments section earlier as well is if you truly believe that Josh Allen is an elite quarterback then you should truly buy into the idea that he can elevate the talent around him and I think the second half of last year was an encouraging sign that even without Stefan Diggs is off the rails production you could still get high output from Josh Allen and therefore complementary pieces are what you could potentially see Joe Brady work with and what is probably going to be a more systematic West Coast style offense with the ability to feature Josh Allen's talent as more of a here and there when we need it, but we don't need to do it all the time and make it be Superman versus whatever the hell you saw for the past couple of years. So Luca, any more thoughts on that concept with Joe Brady? No, I mean, realistically, at the end of the day, it truly is going to be under a microscope. Joe Brady, what does he give you early on in the season? What is he doing that truly disguises things, creates mismatches? What is he doing that is giving difficulties to defenses? 
And then as I mentioned before, how is he then going to adjust to that? Because you're, and it's not like we need Joe Brady to be a true elite play caller. You need him to be a good one, if not borderline great. And on top of that, the great ones essentially have a plan and an idea for what they're doing, not only in the beginning of the season, but later on, they are truly setting things up. It is true chess. So on top of it, what you put on tape in those first eight weeks, what are you then doing to answer those things that are inevitable and coverages or whatever it might be that defenses are going to key on to then still maximize output, get Josh Allen to be able to be the best of himself. And how is that going to all work out? Because I truly believe if everything out the gate goes well, but it really starts to stall out discussions are going to be had very early often on Mm. is Joe Brady capable? Does he, you know, is he truly trying to do something that is possible at the NFL or is he just out of his depth a little bit? Is he not quite getting that? Hey, once you put it on film, man, it is basically over. Unless you have a money play, a true money play, which, you know, all the great teams have, of course. But overall, if that's the only thing working, you got to have an answer. You got to be better than that. You have to do something. Josh Allen can't always be Superman, even though he really is the one wearing a cape at times. And you just need to do what you can do at your best to put him in the best position to succeed. So it will be very, very interesting this year to see what he does. I'm quite excited to see it. I I think when you talk about Joe Brady in the sense that if they don't or if they come out of the gate hot, but it kind of sputters out, there will be warranted criticism. And again, you know, he had his past regimen in Carolina. And on the flip side of them having 3000 yard receivers, he made it a season and a half, even though there's debate about whether it was justified or not. I will be watching very closely. And I do understand that like Ken Dorsey, we have to hold Joe Brady to the same standards and criticism when Josh Allen is your quarterback. And especially if you go into the draft and post free agency allocating a lot of your assets to your offense and you aren't in you know in the range of where you'd like to be offensively but to the flip I think if Joe Brady can get that much production out of three separate players and an offense man by Teddy Bridgewater who I thought is a, I, I think is a good quarterback or thought he retired but obviously Josh Allen when you look at them comparing them is the superior player and the more elite player then I think you have to be encouraged by the fact that Joe Brady's offense really schemes people open and is putting the offense in a position where we don't have to be handcuffed to one specific idea one specific concept Josh be Superman if you have to be but we don't need you to be all the time run if it's there but if you're not you know if it's not a play that I draw up for you and you don't need to scramble because we got someone open then that's a world I'd like to live in I think I saw a comment earlier uh in our chat and i'd have to scroll up and i don't want to lose it or lose the point but it was more about a few years ago josh they were saying josh allen isn't a west coast off or west coast quarterback but now all of a sudden he is i will say that i do have some concerns about josh's middle of the field accuracy even to this day because he's more of a put it on you type of quarterback but with this continued development in the league and some of this i i guess if you want to call it execution that he had with brady in the second half of the year i can see a world where they can make a whole season out of it and also i'm not saying that whoever made this comment is making this point but i think we equate west coast with the inability to ever air it out or want to air it out when the reality is it's more of just trying to get your quarterback in rhythm with some concepts that get you short chunks of yardage early and often but when those big plays open up you're able to take that shot and that's what Allen is capable of doing maybe you have to feed into Allen's arm a little bit more to get some rhythm for his deep passing but I still think that just because it's a West Coast offense doesn't mean you're mitigating Allen's true strength as much as you're not making him throw it 20 yards down the field 10 times a game when you don't have to because it's double covered and there's something easier underneath that's more of just flipping the paradigm so luca all great points on joe brady but now i am going to ask you and and i guess this will be a fun closing topic because free agency still is a thing even though we already got curtis samuel it is still a thing and i don't think the bills are done looking for receivers in free agency i know there have been tweets i know that there have been people saying that they're still very involved in the market but of these names i'll read a few hunter renfro Allen Robinson, OBJ, Michael Gallup. I saw people in the chat talking about Tyler Boyd, Slantman Quantumania, Michael Thomas, Marquez Valdez Scantling, Russell Gage, DJ Chark, Jamal Agnew, Deontay Hardy, Michael Hardman. All right, I'll stop there. Those are some names that are still floating. Do you see them attacking any of these guys while they are still floating around? And do you like the idea of still adding one more vet if you do decide to draft one to two more receiver prospects? 
Um, yeah, I think it all comes after the draft, first and foremost. They're, they will not be doing anything before the draft because you want to truly understand how that all breaks down, whatever you're doing, and then go from there. What I will say is I do... I'm not going to say they're going to do it. I can absolutely see them doing it, though, more so than just sitting on their hands. Right. I, I think if they were to go out and get, let's just throw Michael Thomas out there for the sake of conversation. If they go out and they convince Michael Thomas to come in and, and kind of see what they can do with him, the ceiling, of course, is very high with him, although it's been years since he's been anywhere near there. But overall, you bring someone in with great experience, and then on top of it, you just have that there where you're not trying to put the rooks in uncomfortable positions as best as you can. Now, there's a conversation, of course, there where we almost get frustrated to a point where it's like, hey, can you please try to ask these rookies to do something? Because it's proven in the past with other teams that they can do things and you're just not giving them opportunities. That's a different discussion. Right. Overall, though, you don't want them to be feeling like the weight is truly on their shoulders. Even if you did make an aggressive move, let's say to move up for a Roma Dunze, I can absolutely see a world where they still then sign a DJ Chark or a Michael Thomas. Yep. And then essentially, hey, Rome, we would love if you could truly be that ceiling. But we do have this veteran here that has proven that at least we can get by with. We have Curtis Samuel, we have Shakir. And to the points we'd be a we have been discussing earlier it's not like they're kind of sitting in their positions most likely they're going to be moving chess pieces they're going to probably in all reality be moving around shifting around and being used in a multitude of ways which has clearly been there even pre joe brady offense they've been right. trying to bring in guys with that capability that overall you bring in a veteran presence again because right now in that uh, curtis samuel is your veteran Right. And I, I have no problem with that, but just having another veteran voice that is also hungry for success is not an issue whatsoever. And if you can kind of manage a way to bring in a DJ Chark or a Michael Thomas or whatever it might be, I only see value in that. And, and at yeah. the end of the day, that makes a lot of sense to me. If you are truly still trying to compete year in, year out, which as long as you have 17, you absolutely are. You just have to be more and more creative now that you got rid of your previous number one. Yeah, and I love that point too because there's no there's no pressure to sign any of these free agents. There's no gun to your head telling you you need to to be successful. This is bottom of the room or midway through the room, kind of like how we see Matt Collins, who I think, you know, Matt Collins, I actually could see a viable role for him in this offense as a blocker and some downfield stuff because he's a big body and he's had some success. And he also taking a receiver from the Falcons that had Desmond Ritter throwing down the field inconsistently makes me think that there is some sneaky level of production you could get out of Matt Collins, which would be absolutely hilarious. But with these other free agents you have on this list, there's no harm if the price is right for, I would say, a good amount of them. And I know a, a few people are talking about Chark. I think Chark's the one I'd go for just because of age, because he's only 27 years old, and because of his boundary presence, his ability to play there, and because you might get him for really good value because he's really never played with anyone elite in his career. So like, maybe you get some hidden gem in DJ Chark that ends up being your serviceable tertiary boundary option. And one thing I will say is while they did get Curtis Samuel, who's been a mix of a wide out and slot, but really thrives in a slot role. I think that the one thing I know about Brandon Bean when it comes to free agency going into the draft is that he doesn't like to leave glaring holes. Even if the person he signs at that position is not your starter of the future, it is a body for that position. Like, I don't think that Austin Johnson is going to be the final DT or I'm sorry, not Austin Johnson. Cause we signed um, Deshaun Williams. I don't think that's the last DT you see added. I think they're still, they put the body there to have the depth, but they could still draft a DT. My same thing goes for wide receiver at the boundary, especially after you get rid of Stefan Diggs. And now you expose yourself for really not having true vertical, full vertical threats. I'm not talking about guys that, you know, Khalil Shakir and Curtis Samuel can go upfield. Dalton Kikik can go upfield. But I find a lot of value to them being able to work in the short to intermediate parts of the field over the middle. That's where I really see you eating teams alive with that. I think burners, the ability to go upfield is something that now we're going to need in this offense with a combination of speed, being able to high point a little bit of size. And therefore, I think that's the justification for a guy maybe like DJ Chark, maybe like a like Valdez Scantling or honestly, man. I can be talked into OBJ. I can be talked into it. Now, hear me out here. 
it wouldn't be as expensive as years past. And I would do it for the right price, the right price. But he was playing at Baltimore. He obviously wasn't the same elite status, but he's also coming off the year of being out of football and had some production. If OBJ plays for you for a year on a low, maybe not that minimum, but a little bit higher contract, and you're telling me that this man is the wide receiver that's coming after Curtis Samuel, Khalil Shakir, and rookie, maybe rookie number two as well, because you draft someone for his future. I could be talked into it because if you're talking one year deal for a 31 year old receiver that still has some ability to play, I'll take it. But the reality is, I still think that a boundary body is a need in free agency as much as it is in the draft. And I don't know if they want to go in with the hole. So that's my justification for it. I would hope it's Chark. I saw him post a picture today of him on the Panthers playing against the Falcons on Twitter. I don't know if that meant anything or if he was just like, oh, I miss football. I love my teammates. Or if he's like going back to Carolina. So I'm not committing to saying let's sign him because I feel like if I do that, I'm going to speak it out of existence and he's just going to re-sign with Carolina in like two hours. But that's my thoughts on free agency, Luca. Any more thoughts on it? The uh, OBJ or even more so the MVS. If if we sign MVS, the memes, honestly, are first and foremost oh, yeah. in my mind. I, I, I'm going to be quite frank. Sometimes there are just things in the universe that happen where the first thing that comes to my mind is, yeah, I've, I got I to gotta make a meme on this. I got I to gotta mm. think of something. It, it's, it's too good. But overall, um, yeah, I, I love your point. I, I think it's a point that is very valid that is sometimes forgotten that Bean truly is the individual that, he fills bodies and roles, but it does not cause effect anything with his draft philosophy and vice versa. Like there is no correlation there. He is just, especially in the draft, it is a lot of BPA. Sometimes it's a little bit need driven with blue chip in this sake. It's probably going to be so with the mindset being where can we get the receivers we like in the best spots available. But overall, it's always BPA. So if if the interior D line just keeps falling to him, he will happily take them if he yeah. likes them over everyone else, or they just keep falling to him and move on with his day and then adjust the roster accordingly. That's just how he operates. And that's a great way to operate. That is mm-hmm. what you should do in that in that kind of uh field. So overall, yeah, I the the free agent wide receiver market, as I just constantly look down and look at it, it's funny to me. And it would be fascinating to see which individual they would bring in because I do think. There is a real, real, real chance that Bean will be working those phones with agents trying to bring an individual in that fits the criteria that we're discussing here, where it's kind of a a go up and get it boundary receiver, because that is still something Mm -hmm. as we've discussed at length at this point that is needed on this roster. And more money is opening up after June 1st once Trey's contract comes off and you get that 10 and a half mil, obviously offset by three mil now, so a little bit tighter, but you sign your free agents and then there's a couple of million dollars floating around that you might be able to allocate to someone for a season. And maybe that's what Bean is planning on doing. And maybe post June 1st is the move. You saw last year when they did it with a couple guys, including Leonard Floyd. I think there's a way to construct a contract. If you really did think OBJ was the one you wanted and he was asking for like four mil, maybe some way to kind of negotiate negotiate and get them on a fair price or you end up going just bottom of the barrel to get another body in the room like a like a late camp edition or someone for camp like Tavon Austin a few years ago and just see what you got but I think that free agency is still something they're actively going to pursue it's really just a matter of which guy they feel fits the room best I don't know if they'll do it within the next couple of weeks to go into free agency and ha- or I'm sorry go into the draft and have a guy but it wouldn't surprise me because like I said Bean is definitely a guy that does not like to keep his needs glaring especially Especially in a draft where teams might try to prey on the Bills if they are attempting to make some sort of significant trade up or down. So it's my final thoughts on free agency. But Luca, we're almost at the hour mark. I think it's time we wrap it up this evening. Friends in the chat, please do me a favor and drop a like if you haven't already. And stick around because 9 p.m. Anthony Prohaska is live for all of you with another interesting episode of Disguise Coverage that you should all tune into. But Luca... Always appreciate you having, always appreciate you being on here. I always appreciate when I don't <laughs> stutter when I try to say anything on this show, but that happens every week. You're all going to have to deal with it. Let the people know what you and Josh got going on, where they could find you, all that good stuff. The floor is yours. Funny enough, we're most active on Twitter if you're not already aware. Jo- uh, Joe, geez, I almost did Josh again. Joe, it's rubbing off. my Twitter stuttering's rubbing here. off on you. <laughs> yeah. Um, find us at Bill's Chat Pod. Josh mainly runs that account and he is very, very active on it. But then you can also find us on YouTube. Uh, we are independent at this point and loving life, to be quite honest. And you can find us at YouTube, uh, at Bill's Chat Pod as well on YouTube with all of our content stuff. I will say um, I have Sabres talk or Sabres chat 
that to do later tonight as I'm currently been watching the Sabres, uh, what you call it, Sabres Dallas game at this moment in time, which is a wild one. But overall, come find us there. Uh, it's two one sabers now at this point. Okay. Um, but uh, overall, find us on those platforms. We love just talking ball, just like everyone else does here at Cover One. And we are just, I can tell you right now, we are very, very excited for the draft, especially after Diggs trade, because the the world is our palette and we have no idea what the heck's gonna happen. So <laughs> I, I'm very, very, very excited. Yeah. And guys, Josh and Luca do a great job. I've had both of them on the show numerous times. I've been on their show. They're awesome guys. Great conversation covers a variety of bills topics and also Sabres chat. I am personally not a Sabres fan, but I support the channel and all you do because listen, I'm a bills fan and I know everyone who's in the Sabres community has been through a lot. And I certainly want the best for you guys. I want you all to be happy. I want to see some fun with that team because it's good for the city of Buffalo. And I care about that, even though I'm not from Buffalo and have never actually lived there in my life. I know. Oh, he's not. He's a poser, whatever. But no, seriously, Luca, thank you so much again. Please go check out a show. And I just want to throw this on real fast. This, this means the world to me. Thank you so much. I honestly... Love doing this show every single week, at least when things are working and everything is built because I wasn't live last week because I was building the new computer. But <laughs> I, I love doing this show every week. I love being here in front of all of you. I know, you know, sometimes there's tech issues and everything, but seeing comments like this mean the world to me. The likes mean the world to me. Engagement on Twitter, on YouTube, whatever it is, it means the world. I appreciate, again, all of you for tuning in, being here and being able to listen to us and just, you know, chiming in. It really does mean the world. But my name is Joe DeRosa. You can find me on Twitter on show underscore DeRosa. And like Drew says here, I am not an AI bot. I am a man who is hoping that the Buffalo Bills offense will figure it out. But with Brandon Bean making such a drastic move, all it tells me is there is a plan in place. So be patient. Trust the process. We will see what happens. But ultimately, I think we're going to be in for a fun 2024 one way or the other. And I am excited to see what they do, what they come up with, and what this offense looks like. But... On that note, I hope you all have a great rest of your Tuesday evening. Again, in about 19 minutes, disguise coverage. Mr. Anthony Prohaska starts up, so check that one out. If you are listening to us after the fact on our podcasting platforms or on YouTube, please, again, a like, five stars. It is always appreciated for our podcast listeners. If you can do a five star on Spotify, Apple, wherever you listen, that will help us out immensely. And sign up for the one pass that is in the description below. But for Luca of Bill's Chat and for myself, we are out this evening. Have a wonderful Tuesday and we will see you soon. Go, Bills.